Thank you for joining us in our exciting webinar today, Benchmark, Benchmarking the State of Leadership Development. My name is Tracy Dobbins, and I'll be your webinar host for the session. If you're just getting to know us, CCL is a top-ranked provider of executive education globally. We work with two-thirds of the world's top 500 companies, small business, and government, providing innovative solutions for the entire organization and programs proven to transform the individual. Our work is based on significant research, and we share it readily with you today in this discussion. Before our presenters begin, please know that we love participation and invite you to use the chat tool provided on the right side of your screen. You can ask questions or interact with the presenters, and you can also just interact with the host, presenter, or panelist. We will also be sending out a few polls during today's session for you to engage with us during the, the webinar. A more formal question and answer session will be held at the end of the webinar. And finally, look tomorrow to receive a web uh, email with a link to the recorded version and uh, also links to the full research report that we'll be talking about today. Pleased to have with us members of our global marketing strategy team at Center for Creative Leadership. We have Susan Smith, Dr Group Director, Global Marketing Strategy. Also joining Susan is Mike Cook, Global Markets and Client Insights Manager, and Paula Morrow, Global Marketing Research Manager. Welcome, Susan, Mike, and Paula. I'll now turn the session over to Paula, who will kick off this important preview of our new, brand new marketing research into the state of leadership development. Thanks, Tracy. So CCL conducted three research studies that will be included in our presentation today. First, there was a, the Leadership Development of the Future study, and the reason we did that was to get a better understanding of the current and future state of leadership development, um, as well as the key behaviors and needs for both HR decision makers and learners of the future. Um, we used both qualitative and quantitative methods, including in-depth phone interviews with HR decision makers and an online survey with 100 learners. Um, the second study was a leader-level spending study to better understand how HR decision makers think about and manage their leadership development budgets um, across different leader levels. So that's from individual contributors all the way up to executives. Um, and we also wanted to understand sort of their attitudes and behaviors um, that influence their investment decisions in leadership development. So this was an online survey with 250 mid to senior level HR decision makers. Um, and then we've just recently completed an update to the leader level spending study, um, and that was 300 HR decision makers. Um, to, so we wanted to benchmark the trends that we saw in the first study and, um, and see if anything had changed from what we heard the first time. And last but not least, uh, we reviewed additional industry reports about the current and future trends in leadership development and spending, um, like the one you're going to hear about um, from the conference board that Mike's going to tell you about next. Thanks, Paula. Um, so as organizations look to grow and succeed in a marketplace with potential disruptors around virtually every corner, um, they know that effective leadership is going to be crucial to implementing their business strategies. So we see survey after survey of both the C-suite and HR and training development executives tell us that leadership development is a top priority for their organizations, and we're seeing that for several different reasons. Um, one of the top reasons is that talent has really become a key competitive advantage for many organizations, and because of demographic shifts and other factors, generational uh, factors, we're seeing many companies finding themselves unable to find talent for their key positions, and they're experiencing a shortage of skilled learners to guide the organization. You know, additionally, we're seeing the rapid pace of technological change, completely changing the way companies do business and the way that employees are working on almost a daily basis. Um, we know organizations are going to need leaders with an evolving set of skills and new leadership competencies to lead the workplace of the future. So again, developing leaders will be a top concern for most organizations, and really we see that concern starts at the top of the organization. And so when we looked at uh, our friends at the conference board's most recent C-suite challenge report, um, they found that the top three internal concerns for the C-suite globally related to talent and leadership issues. Um, the number one top hot button issue for CEOs is the need to attract and retain the organization's top talent. 
62% of those executives surveyed by the conference board said this was going to be a top challenge for them and their organization. Um, they know that in order to create competitive advantage, they're going to need to bring in the best leaders possible and keep them. Um, and we know that one of the keys to retention, uh, continue, re research continues to show us uh, that a top driver of talent retention is providing your employees with development opportunities. Um, the second biggest challenge for the C-suite with about half of the executives surveyed responding related to the impact of digital technologies on the organization and this need they now have to, to re-examine their current business models and create some new ones. So ensuring that the organization has leaders with the skills needed to lead in these new business models is going to be, again, critical for success, uh, and leadership development is what is going to help them meet this challenge. Um, finally, the third most prevalent challenge we saw with the C-suite or the conference board saw with the C-suite, with uh, just over 40% of executives responding, um, was the need to develop the next generation of leaders. Um, organizations know that their success is going to depend on keeping the leadership pipeline full uh, with those leaders who do have the skills needed to uh, um, succeed in the future. Um, so how are these organizations going to address these leadership and talent issues? Um, since talent is such a top hot button issue for CEOs around the world, um, the conference board asked them, uh, what will be the top investments they're going to make to help develop their leaders of the future. And what we saw is that the top overall answer was to invest in formal leadership development. Um, this was also the top investment that executives in the United States would make. Uh, it was also the second biggest investment that would be made for executives in both Europe and Latin America. Um, other investments included things like providing cross-functional job rotation experiences, uh, providing more executive coaching initiatives, and creating a more diverse leadership pool. But overall, providing formal leadership opportunities was by far the biggest investments the company said they would be making in the next few years uh, to prepare their leaders for the future. So with leadership development being such an important challenge and so many organizations spending so much on it, uh, we at the Center for Career Leadership, we wanted to see um, how companies were investing these dollars and where they were investing these dollars. So we conducted two, um, the, the two studies we're going to talk about today. Um, we knew going into this research that leadership development was a huge market. Um, by our estimates, the global market for external outsourced leadership development products and services alone is about $38 billion. And once you add in things like internal expenditures, salaries, and other expenses, you're looking at a total global market that's quickly approaching $100 billion. Um, we also know it's a very highly fragmented market. Um, organizations have literally thousands of options for providers of leadership development products and services, and there's very few clear market leaders. So with so many choices in such a big market, we wanted to get a clear understanding um, of leadership development spending. Um, so before I begin to um, talk about what we found, we wanted to see what happened in your own organizations this year with your own leadership development budgets. So we wanted to take a little poll. Um, would you say that for 2019, your leadership development budget either A, increased, B, decreased, or C, stayed the same? So if you wouldn't mind uh, taking a moment to, uh, to answer our poll, um, just so we can see um, what was going on in your own organizations before we found out, before we uh, share what we found out, uh, what was happening in other organizations. And if you have a group with you, um, just take a quick consensus of the group and make one response. Thank you. And I, I saw that there was a, a question. Wonder if you don't know. <laughs> oh, don't know. Uh, that's a good. That's a good uh, answer. Maybe just say stay the same. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it'll be interesting to see how uh, closely uh, our findings match what the uh, the audience is going to tell. So we starting to see some results coming in. Um, Looks like some increase, a little bit of decrease. Most stayed the same. Still waiting on some people to answer. 
I think we've got them all in now, okay. Mike. Looks like uh, stay the same. Okay. Like the all house. right. So thank you. Thanks for uh, thanks for your feedback. So looking at what we found out, um, while most of you said your organizational budgets for leadership development stayed the same this year. Um, what we found out is the majority of organizations surveyed, 79% uh, actually, said they inspected an increase in their overall annual leadership budget for this year. Um, in our study, about 12% said they would stay the same, um, that their budget would remain the same for the year, and only 9% expected their leadership development budget to be cut. Uh, when we took into account all of the expected budget changes for 2019, um, the average increase in the overall annual leadership budget was 10%, so that was the average increase. Um, when we asked those who were increasing their budget, um, about a third of them said they expected to increase it by about 5 to 10%. Um, about a quarter said they were going to increase it by 10 to 25%. Um, and there were even 8% who expected an increase of 25% or more. Um, so very optimistic outlook. Um, towards leadership development budgets um, when we asked for 2019. We also wanted to know who was able to influence the leadership development budget and who owned or controlled the leadership development budget. When it came to influencing, we saw that the decision was uh, equally distributed with about one-third of the influence coming from the HR or learning and development function at 36%. Uh, and then we saw another third, about 34% of that influence, came from the learner themselves, uh, as we see more individuals take responsibility for their own development. And then the, remi the remainder of the decision, about, uh, again, almost another third at 29%, uh, was being made from the learner's direct manager, making uh, recommendations on, on, on perhaps what they could uh, uh, do for their development. Um, in regards to the ownership of the budget, you know, just over half of it is with HR at about 54%, uh, sorry. Um, almost a third of that, 31%, uh, and uh, nearly a quarter um, are held by HR at a function or a business sign level. And then the remaining percentage of the budget is distributed fairly evenly across a corporate function um, and business line leaders. So again, most of it being controlled by uh, uh, HR uh, with the corporate and the business line. Um, controlling the remaining budgets. So then when we look at spending, we asked um, what they were spending, um, how much their organizations were spending, and we found that the median budget across all organizations was $346,200. So just a reminder or just a refresher from your statistics course days, uh, that median number, uh, that's telling us that half of the answers we received were above that number and half were below. So the median, the middle number, is uh, the 346000 We also found that budgets increased as the size of the organization's workforce increased, um, and they also increased as their annual revenue increased. So larger organizations, both in terms of employees and revenue, will spend more on leadership development. Uh, we found that companies that make over $1 billion in revenue per year have a median spend of nearly $511,000, and companies with 50,000 or more employees are going to spend a median of about $857,000 a year on leadership development. We also wanted to know how they were allocating that um, budget across leader level. Um, we found that the allocation of the budget is split almost evenly for each leadership level at approximately 20%. However, we did see as the leader level increased, we did find that more is spent on each individual leader. Um, your first level of leadership, your individual contributors, they receive on average about $2,600 per leader annually. And as you move up the levels, your senior level leaders and executives are more likely to receive an average of about $4,000 per leader every year for leadership development. Um, one of the more interesting findings about spending in our study was that almost every company we surveyed said they were willing to spend more on a high potential employee. Uh, in fact, over one-third of the respondents said they would spend 25% more 
uh, and almost another third said they would spend 50% more on a high potential employee. We next looked at how organizations were splitting their investment development spending between internal and external investments. Uh, we found the overall spend of the leadership development budget was close to an even 50-50 split uh, between both internal and external programs, although uh, we did see a slight favor for the internal programs of 52%. Um, and unlike the uh, budgeted amount, the budgeted the annual budget amount where we saw that uh, uh, it increased as uh, org size increased, we found that um, this split remained constant, this 50-50 split remained fairly constant even as the organization's revenue increased. Um, additionally, we found that over the next 12 months, the typical increases in spend will be about the same for both internal programs and external vendors. So overall, we saw very few organizations were going to decrease spending on either internal or external activities in the year ahead. And finally, with nearly 50% of leadership development dollars being dedicated to external activities, it became obvious to us that no organization can do everything on their own. Um, in fact, we found out that a large percentage of the organizations we surveyed do outsource a good portion of their leadership development training, both face-to-face -face training as well as digital learning. Um, approximately 70% of the organizations are outsourcing their face-to-face -face training to some extent, while roughly 80% are outsourcing their digital learning to some extent. Um, and roughly, we saw that roughly a quarter to one-third of those respondents did also expect to spend more on outsourced services in the next year, depending on the activity. So now I'd like to turn things over to Susan, who will share with you the strategies that organizations are going to use to implement leadership development. Thank you, Mike. Now that Mike has shared with you the value of leadership development in organizations and how much they are spending on it, I'd like to share how they are spending their leadership development budget. The leadership development is delivered in many modalities. We found no one initiative or program is taking up the majority of the annual leadership development budget. Uh, in fact, organizations employ quite a few different strategies. The most common are face-to-face -face and online courses. Combined, they make up about 60% of the budgets. And this wasn't surprising to us because uh, these delivery methods typically have higher price tags. Um, before you ask me, face-to-face -face training is made up of customized and open enrollment programs, workshops, and conferences. Uh, online courses consist of self-paced online learning with or without uh, a facilitator. It was a little surprising that coaching didn't receive more of the budget because it is growing so fast in popularity. And um, all the or, uh, rotational assignments and on-the-job training are used frequently. This percentage made sense to us since this is a methodology that doesn't require a lot of money. Um, and this was a budget question, not a use question. Mike talked about the importance of leadership development with CEOs. We also wanted to know where the HR decision makers believe leadership development was valuable to their business strategies. Leadership development is most frequently used to build um, capabilities of employees. Without it, organizations believe that they would not be able to execute their business strategy. So there's more and more areas today where leadership development is thought to be critical to achieving their strategic goals. Of course, things like succession planning and a decrease in turnover are obvious goals um, that leadership development helps with. But we thought it was interesting that HR decision makers also included things like improve the customer experience and leverage technology. And this led us to believe that this is another indication of how important leadership development is within the organization since they're using it for more and more organizational goals. No one type of delivery method stands out as the most common for leadership development. In fact, the most common activities are, are a mix or a blend of digital and face-to-face. -face. Um, we thought this quote from a chief talent officer at a financial services company was a good way to sum it up. We let anybody take anything and we have learning maps so if someone wants to become a people manager, then these things and these are the things you should be learning. 
if it is a blended approach, it is a blended approach, but our belief is that if you tell the leader what he or she needs to be successful, then it will be upon them to use resources. It places the accountability on the learner. So this was a way where the, this um, talent officer was talking about how they wanted to be able to do different types of uh, methodologies and to put it, the accountability on the learner. In a few minutes, Paula will talk more on how to mix these different delivery methods um, in the future. So today there is almost an equal use of face-to-face -face and, and digital delivery for leadership development. If you think about training overall, then you would expect digital to have surpassed face-to-face. The nature of leadership development content doesn't always lend itself easily, though, to, um, to an online format. Of course, digital does help to get leadership development content uh, throughout the organization at a scale that face-to-face -face, uh, often can't do. Anyway, we thought it was interesting that they were almost equal. So now it's your turn. Um, <coughs> looking forward to the next five years, so five years from now, where do you expect the mix of face-to-face -face <coughs> digital delivery to shift for leadership development within your organization. So will it be a significant increase toward face-to-face -to -face, or a slight increase toward face-to-face? -to -face? Or maybe you believe that there will be no change within your organization. Or in the next five years, do you believe that there will be a slight increase toward digital? Or do you believe that there will be a significant increase toward digital? So in the next five years, where do you expect the shift, if any, in your organization? So it would be interesting to see how what, what you all are, are responding to, how that is what we got in the results from our survey. So again, this is five years from now. Where do you expect that shift? And this is for leadership development, not training overall. Okay, I think the poll is ended. We're going to push out the results and share right. those with you. Thank you all for participating in the poll. We gonna, there yep. we go. There we go. Wow, okay, so the majority believe that there will be a slight increase toward digital, followed by a significant increase toward digital. So digital is, looks like the number one winner, which is very interesting from the results that we got. Uh, so what we found was that, um, and, and we expected the same thing, and so the results surprised us. We expected digital delivery to overtake face-to-face -face delivery in the future. Um, we expected face-to-face uh, -to, -face to definitely decrease, but that is not what the HR decision makers and learners reported. Both face-to-face -face and digital are expected to grow equally by 38% within the next five years. What really surprised us was that and so that's a, two, a top two box score when you look at the 38%, but when you look at the top box score, so the significant increase, um, it surprised us that face-to-face -face, uh, was reported to have, a, that they thought that there would be a significant growth of 19% versus digital significant growth of 12%. So it's a 7% difference between the two. So face-to-face -face definitely is not declining as a delivery method for uh, leadership development, but at the same time, we, we cannot um, ignore the role that digital plays. So while we had the overall numbers for what methodologies HR decision makers invested, on, invested in, we were definitely curious as well um, if there were differences by the levels within an organization or the leader levels. Uh, we would have expected more digital delivery in the lower levels and more face-to-face -face in the higher levels. However, we found that face-to-face -face training is the top delivery method for each leader level, and it is followed closely by online training. And again, this isn't today. This is not looking forward five years from now. Um, the two delivery 
methods follow an almost perfect bell curve with leading managers, the middle level, uh, there in the darkest blue, using the most of both with face-to-face -face at 90% and online learning at 83%. It was interesting that at the highest level, the leading the organization, that they used face-to-face uh, 61% -face and online learning 60%. We would have expected that online learning would be significantly lower at this level, and yet they were about the same. There are a few differences among the levels. Um, so lo the lower levels use assessments less frequently than the two higher leader levels. That's not really surprising, and also not surprising, the two highest levels uh, didn't use rotational and on-the-job training um, as much as the lower levels did. So what isn't working well with leadership development? And this is according to the HR decision makers. Um, while today leadership development is very popular and important within organizations, there are several things that are not working well. Um, first of all, leadership development usually is not very flexible. Uh, leaders at all levels are increasingly facing an ever-changing environment. Um, a lot can happen in just a work week. Uh, and so they don't want to miss what's happening in that work week and go away for training. And most leadership development training is offered at a fixed time, and it's usually several days long, sometimes a week or, uh, a week or more. <coughs> Learners might give up their time if they thought that the development was connected to the business, meaning they could get something um, out of the training that they could apply directly to their work, then they're more likely to do it. And a lot of times what leadership development is, is it's something that it might be useful in the, in the future versus something that they can apply directly to the work. Too often, um, people look at leadership development as one size fits all instead of making this connection. As prevalent as leadership development is to an organization's goals, often it's treated as an event. Um, it's prioritized only for a short amount of time instead of an organizational priority throughout the year. We were really surprised at this because when you look at what Mike said about the CEOs and what I talked about, the importance um, that the HR decision makers said about leadership development being part of the business strategy and part of the success of the organization, yet what we found, one of the things that wasn't working with well with it is that it isn't prioritized um, highly when it comes to actually executing uh, leadership development within the organization. HR decision makers talked about how at the lower levels of the organizations they focus more on skill building for a specific function than on leadership development. And they think that they're not giving enough um, uh, to these lower levels that they need to start earlier in leadership development um, so that they can be successful in the future. Um, they really think that this is a problem and that it needs to be addressed. And then finally, there's programs that are designed for the masses versus individuals. Uh, some of the other key themes that emerged about what is not working well with leadership development include that the activities are really dated, um, such as pre-recorded webinars um, and scheduled programs, annual performance reviews. Um, so these HR decision makers know that they need to look at um, traditional leadership development uh, differently, and so now I'm going to turn it over to Paula so that she can talk about just how they're going to do that and uh, the future of leadership development. Thanks, Susan. So while organizations believe that leadership development is critical for their success, it just isn't your father's leadership development anymore. <clears throat> now it's all about personalization, so getting development when and how the leader wants it. Um, the HR decision makers we interviewed knew that they needed to sort of freshen up their leadership development. So let's go over some of the key opportunities um, for improvement that our research identified. So overall, there were sort of four key ways that our respondents wanted to improve leadership development. First, they wanted to create strategies that enable them to sort of turn the reins of leadership development over to the learners. So many of them felt really strongly that um, moving the accountability to the learner is important for the future of development. Um, especially as they, they're trying to create sort of individual learning journeys for each of their employees. Um, also, they want to offer a variety of options for learners. So multiple delivery method, methods, even for the same topic. Um, to make learning 
useful and they want a menu of options so that similar content can appeal to different types and levels of learners. Um, so they might be at a different point in their career and they might you know, have different objectives and it could include things like online learning and face-to-face um, -face training. HR leaders also are looking for ways to enhance the learning experience and to make it stick. Um, so along with menu options, they want to incorporate more like bite-sized learning and a variety of digital tools into their development. Um, so it sort of increases the engagement of the learner during and after any kind of leadership development. And our respondents want to learn, want to start that leadership development even earlier in a person's career. So they believe that there's a much higher success rate if they begin uh, leadership development at lower levels of the organization and that, that it continues to span over their career, so not just waiting until they become senior leaders. So let's get a little bit more specific. According to our respondents, successful leadership development activities shared five qualities that are directly tied to engagement and the buy-in of the learner. Um, we learned that blended approaches, more interaction, and clear connection to their jobs are considered to be the best way to get the learner to engage in development um, and ensure that they're getting as much out of it as possible. Um, the learners want a mix of digital and face-to-face, -face, just like Susan was talking about, um, and the methods, they want it to be dynamic and have choices so that the learners stay engaged. So that might look like you know, a webinar here, a quiz there, an in-person session to tie it all together. Um, successful development also needs full organizational support from the top. So when there, there's more buy-in from the learners when one leader level, so maybe executives, uh, becomes involved in the training of the other levels. So one organization that we interviewed hosted a, like a live event once a year where their board members and their senior executives um, would assist in the training for the new managers. So they'd participate in the exercises and they'd share their experiences. And this is like a great way to show the learners that the entire organization really supports their leadership development. Learners also want experiential type training designed to help them in a way that connects to the way they're working. So, and I think someone mentioned like action learning. So it's learning that's teaching them skills um, that they can use in their jobs versus in a vacuum. Um, they want team-based activities, scenario-based learning, and other ways that, you know, to help them apply leadership development concepts and sustain the learning long term so they just don't forget it right after they leave. Uh, successful development also includes elements that allow for interaction and demand attention. So things like gamification and Q&A sessions, you know, whether they're online or in person, um, are really preferred over to sort of static lectures. Um, the use of videos, polls, infographics, like anything that increases the visual stimuli and increases engagement versus you know, allowing the learner to sort of check the box or go through the motions is what you want. Um, and finally, including tools and assessments that help identify a particular employee's like strengths or development areas are also useful in making the learning more personal. Um, they can open lines of communication and help design the right mix of development opportunities for each individual. So what should you remember um, about ways to improve your development going forward? Um, in the last three to five years, there's been a shift in leadership development to be more flexible, more dynamic, more innovative. Um, and as I've been talking about, there's a greater emphasis on the learner themselves. So not just what they need to learn, but how they want to learn it. Uh, leadership development strategies will look for, you know, will look a lot more customizable, and not just to the in individual, but also to the organization as well. So customization is sort of the way of the world going forward. Our research uncovered four overarching learning trends, um, and that was identified by the HR leaders and the learner. So keep these in mind as you're planning your strategies and budgets for the next year. So multi-method learning. So in incorporating new technology, delivery methods, and content that will make you know, learning more dynamic. Um, there will still be face-to-face, -face, but also incorporating digital tools and self-led activities to sort of create a more well-rounded um, approach to leadership development. Um, we've been hearing this over time, but there will still continue to be more just-in-time and bite-sized learning. Um, frequent shorter bursts of, of learning will encourage greater participation. Um, and help the learners schedule that um, development around their workloads. So we heard a lot about workloads um, and that you know, leadership development doesn't really fit 
into all the, the work they're trying to get done. So not only will it help them work around their schedules, but it will also help um, keep their leadership development sort of current um, and not something they just dust off once a year when they have the one-time event that Susan was talking about. Um, an HR manager that we talked to in the healthcare industry said they are hungry for a personal experience. The way people are learning now is in short snippets versus, dedicated, versus a dedicated day. Everything needs to be an hour or less for people to pay attention and manage the time commitment. So that sounds really familiar to, to a lot of the other uh, numbers that we got in our survey. Um, learner accountability is still important. Uh, we've been talking about that. Putting more responsibility on the employee and making them a stakeholder in their own learning and development will be the norm. Um, this can be facilitated you know, by making the content openly accessible to the learner and across leader levels. And personalization, personalization, personalization. I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, so uh, learning trends will be to use diagnostic tools, assessments, self-led activities, action learning, and any kind of program that will allow for more flexibility in their work schedules and to accommodate different learning styles and different generational preferences. All those things are going to be important to help learners stay engaged. So HR leaders expect these shifts to continue and grow stronger in the future and also see them moving into personal devices and using tools like artificial intelligence and virtual reality, but that's coming soon. All right. So I really want to wrap up everything that we've learned today uh, about the importance of leadership development, current leadership development strategies, um, and opportunities to improve them. So here is a summary of our sort of key findings from all the different studies. So what did we learn? Um, talent is still a hot button issue for CEOs in the coming year, so then that, <clears throat> then that means attracting and retaining talent, adapting to new business models, and ensuring the organization has leaders with the right skills for the future. That's key. Uh, leadership development continu continues to be critical to help with those talent concerns. Organizations want to invest across all leader levels with a mix of digital and face-to-face -face training. Uh, <clears throat> and as we talked about, the proportions of digital face-to-face -face sort of may change a little bit as the responsibility of the learner increases, and that percentage of budget they may be spending um, goes up when you're talking about high potentials. Driving change in an organizational leadership development strategy can be a major challenge like within itself, so, and we know that HR leaders can't do it alone, so they're going to spend about half of their budgets um, with external vendors to help them navigate and employ the best options that are available out there. Um, and as I talked about in several of my slides, learners want to be in control of their journey. In part, that means um, to be able to select from a variety of delivery methods um, for the same content. Um, for some, it might, the goal might be to prepare for a change in responsibility to others. The goal might be to be more effective where they are. So, you know, they may be looking for content for different reasons, so it has to be available um, in all different methods for different reasons. Learning is going to be an ongoing journey that sort of follows them throughout their career. So HR leaders also see the benefits of turning over some of the accountability to, for development to the learner. They're looking um, to move away from that sort of one-size-fits-all approach um, to give the learner more control over their own destiny. All right, so I know that Tracy has been collecting some questions for us. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank uh, you for um, submitting some questions to us. And uh, we will go now to um, that portion of the webinar. Feel free to, you can direct them to all participants so that um, all of you can see the questions being posed to our three speakers today. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, start with uh, questions we have so far. Um, is there a translation for how many times an hour is committed by each group to the leadership training? Yeah, we did not ask the question by hours. We were sort of focused on how much they were spending by leader level, but not specifically how many hours each level spent. Um, Tim's asking, do you have statistics on the participation rates by leader level? Um, he finds that a lower percent of senior leaders take development through their development, uh, though their development may cost more. Yeah. We mostly focused on what they were offering, not uh, what the participation levels were. 
And so, but we do know anecdotally that um, as you increase leader level, that there usually is, you know, although we didn't find it, and we didn't ask it in this study, we do see that um, at the higher levels of the organization, um, not only are there fewer leaders at each level, but they do participate less. So I, I would agree anecdotally with Tim, but we didn't have any uh, data to back it up in this particular study. We didn't ask the question. Rebecca's asking, um, sounds like the survey learned a lot about what learners want, an um, example of blended approaches. Do we know what works? What is the fastest and most impactful way to develop people and get them operating at a higher level? So <clears throat> what we do know is that uh, learners do want, and I think HR decision makers also want this, that they want to be able to, de um, to provide to the learner themselves uh, development and content in a bunch of different delivery methods. So then the learner can pick the thing that is most applicable for them and, and, the, and the time commitment that they want to that. So sometimes, for example, if you have a conflict with somebody on a team that you're on, you want to be able to get that content very easily versus waiting six months to go to some kind of program that has to deal with conflict. So. What we found that uh, we believe that these people think are the most successful is being able to get content when you need it, in the method that you want it, in the content that you want. And so that's where the journey comes in, and that's where the personalization comes in. And uh, that's what's going to be successful for leadership development, that it's, again, it's part of a journey, it's not an event. Uh, are there any findings on vertical development for leaders? Uh, I mean, there are. They're not in this study. It is something that the Center for Creative Leadership has looked at. I know that we do have some white papers around vertical development available on our website. Um, you know, so it is something that uh, um, the Center has done some research on and, and, and work with some organizations, but uh, it wasn't in the study. I'd encourage you to go to our, to our, our website, though, ccl.org, and, and look for those white papers. Just search for vertical development. Uh, did, were there any, was, did you find anything about the learning function being separate from HR, or most of the time is it part of HR? Mm. We didn't really look at um, how organizations were structured. We were more asking individual HR decision makers how they were using their budgets, but not necessarily how they were structured as far as centralization. Uh, was local government part of the study? Yeah, we covered all sectors in the study. So we had government, nonprofit, and for-profit across a variety of industries. Uh, there's a few people who are asking about, do you have any data on the return on investment of leadership development, um, also you know, related to impact? Um, so again, not from this study. Again, you know, we were looking more at spending. Um, again, I would say that is definitely something that we do here at the Center for Creative Leadership. Uh, uh, is sort of evaluating the impact and uh, uh, ROI of leadership development. Uh, I think we'd all like to be able to get to uh, um, a dollar amount of uh, return for our leadership development spend. Um, it's really hard to do. Um, so, uh, you know, we have an impact and evaluation group here at the center who works with our clients when we do training. So we're looking more at things like behavior change. We're looking at things like um, uh, increased self-awareness and other leadership effective measures. Uh, again, I would encourage you to visit our website to, to look at some of those white papers and other things that we've done. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's sort of the holy grail for leadership development is getting to uh, uh, tying your uh, leadership development effort outcomes to business outcomes. John's asking, did you have uh, any input on key topics though? leadership development focused on, like building teams, delegation, developing others? So we, we didn't ask that in this particular study, but in the, remember I told you that we did a follow-up study that we just uh, finished? We do, talk, we do know a little bit more about um, some of the topics, so you'll have to, to look forward to that uh, white paper or presentation coming soon. How important is the concept of self-awareness in development by level? Uh, 
I, I mean, again, it's it's one of the it's one of the key outcomes. Um, a lot of times with uh, leadership development is increased self awareness. I think it's one of the uh, key contributors or components for impact uh, and creating behavior change is to, is to have some increased level of self-awareness. Um, to quantify it or put a level of importance on it, I, I, it's, it's not research that we've done, but we know it's a key component. Across levels. Across all levels, yes, absolutely. For, um, Scott, was um, the live virtual training considered online or digital in the survey? We were using online and digital interchangeably, right? So, yeah, so, it's yes. digital. <laughs> it was okay. considered both. <laughs> um, Amy's asking, are, um, how are the much smaller organizations addressing or handling leadership development? Um, I I think they're they're using similar methods, just on a smaller scale. <clears throat> Excuse me, smaller scale. Right. Okay. Uh, let's see from uh, Loretta. Please share more about the personalization of training and the information you received about generational needs. <clears throat> um, when they talked about personalization, uh, they it was sort of the um, antithesis to what Susan was talking about. You know, the cookie cutter or one size fits all training as how it's perceived maybe now. So <clears throat> personalized to the learner and level. So what things are important to their development? Um, what types of, what type of learner are they? You know, do they prefer face-to-face uh, -face or, you know, digital training? Um, and also, you know, maybe I would, like Susan said, I want to learn about conflict, but I only have an hour versus a week. Um, so, you know, sort of, looking at that particular learner and understanding their timing constraints, their learning style, what generation they may be in, so maybe they just prefer a different type of, one type of training over another, um, and then, you know, kind of creating that learning journey for each person. Yeah, and I think personalization is also a part of being able to get the content when you need it and in the format that you need it. Right, instead of restricting content per level, you know, that somebody may be trying to just get better where they are, so they want a certain kind of content, but they also may be looking forward to a promotion they want to get, so they may be looking at, at content that's maybe a leader level above them, um, but they, you know, in some, some organizations they may not have access to that, so we're saying open access to more content so people can use it as they, for their own personal development. From um, Michelle, um, please discuss the value of mandatory versus voluntary training for various leadership levels. Is that looked at at all? We didn't ask anything about mandatory versus voluntary, but I think um, a lot of the in-depth interviews that we did, we heard that you know HR people want the learners to be engaged and to take it on themselves. So mandatory is sort of, you know, makes that not, <laughs> you may, is not what they're looking for. So, you know, the learners are like, if they have to go, then they think it's maybe not for them or, it's, you know, everybody has to do it. So, so I think the idea of making it engaging enough and personalized enough that people want to go is where we hope the future is going. And that's where connecting to business is really critical because you're going to want to go if it's going to help you solve a problem that you have on your desk right now versus something that might be useful in the future. Thanks. Uh, question from Rebecca. What is the role of executive leadership in the commitment to leadership development investments? Uh, she's saying, sounds like HR controls much of it, but surely the executive team must need to be brought in. Any learnings around that? Yeah, so, so, like I said, not in this particular study, but we do do a lot of um, research to understand who's involved in the making the decisions for spending for leadership development. And what we found is that the executive team, they're definitely influencers in what, you know, what kind of topics are um, taken in leadership development and, you know, what, how much we spend and with which providers. But still the HR department is, you know, making the, doing the actual buying, um, but, but definitely the executive level has an influence um, on, you know, what, what initiatives go forward and how much is spent. Yeah, and I'd also like to comment on the disconnect too. So CEOs, HR decision makers, all believe that leadership development is critical to the business strategies of the organization, 
Yet when you get down to the execution, they're saying that that's one of the problems of leadership development today, that it's not a priority. And usually priorities start at the top. And so it, it makes me wonder, so we didn't ask this specifically, but it's something that I would like to know more about um, because, it, <coughs> because of the dichotomy that came up in, in this, about that they were saying that that was one of the problems with leadership development, that it wasn't a prioritized on a day-to-day -day basis. And so is that a problem because the executive team isn't more uh, committed to it and it's just the CEO and the HR decision makers? You, were you gonna add something? Uh, Alice is asking, do you have a similar study that is focused on companies with under 500 employees? Uh, no, unfortunately we don't. We, um, we, we screened out the smaller organizations. Yeah, for um, this particular one. For, for this particular study. Um, you know, I, I guess if I had to, if I was forced to sort of comment or uh, make a conclusion, I mean, you know, your, your small organization is obviously going to be using probably less face-to-face, -face, more digital. That's definitely a polarity we see with, with the use of digital. It's either going to be scale or cost. You know, I need, to, I need to train a lot of people or I don't have a lot of money. Um, you know, usually as you move from digital to face-to-face, -face, you do see, um, you do see a cost increase. Um, you know, but I think a small organization, you might see more things like coaching or mentoring. Uh, they, they'd still be using everything that a larger organization would use, uh, but maybe on a much smaller scale, probably less customized um, leadership development where they're coming in, and des a, a vendor's coming in and designing a program. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's something we could possibly look at in the future, but, but we, we, we went with larger, over 1,000 uh, employee companies. Patrick asks, um, as you talked with organizations forecasting what will be happening with leadership development, did you slice the data to see if there were any difference, if there were differences in spending between government, nonprofit, for profit? Uh, no, we did not. But that's a good idea. That is something we could go back and do is, and, and see what the some of the spending differences are. Um, you know, with, with the, um, you know, we, we are, as, as Paula mentioned, we do have a more current study that we're still um, looking at the data. So, you know, that's something we're doing. You know, we're looking at sort of uh, um, best, what companies that say they're best in class and leadership development, some of those things. But this could definitely be another, another uh, cross section of the data we could look at as a cross uh, industry sector by nonprofit, for profit, and government. Fair ask. Um, which development methods work better with which competencies? I wish we knew. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, we haven't done anything as far as like specific competencies, competencies or skills uh, if the uh, impact is different based on delivery methods. But I would say HR um, decision makers, some that we talk to, like they, they do think that some of the competencies, particularly in leadership development, um, not all of them, but some of them are things where you know you might need a more personal touch. And now sometimes that can that can be delivered virtually, but just the idea that it's it's personal, like person to person. Um, so I think you know versus something that might be like computer training. Yeah, and I think I would add too that um, what we found in this study and other studies that we have done is that I've never heard it broken out particularly by a competency. It's more of wanting a methodology, a different delivery method for all of the competencies. So I've never heard it particularly broken right. out um, by that before. It's an interesting question. Uh, with your clients, what is the top challenge uh, faced by those leading leadership development? I think the things that we hear most uh, from HR decision makers are that they're facing a lot of uh, change, culture change and change within leadership development and also within their organization. So they are facing all of the things that come along with that. So, um, you know, employee resistance to change, um, motivating employees and keeping them engaged in their jobs. Um, but a lot, a lot of the challenges they're facing have to do with change, whether it's within how they're delivering leadership development or just the organization itself is switching to a new business model or, you know, just, it's just all changed all the time. Follow up on, follow on to that question, does the size of the organization 
impact the challenge areas? I've heard, I mean, pretty much across all types of organizations and all sizes that, you know, they're all facing different kinds of change. So they sort of, you know, it may, it may be a more painful uh, challenge for bigger companies than others or more global companies than others, but in general, all companies are facing this kind of disruption and change in their work, and so therefore their employees are facing it, so the leadership development, they're trying to help uh, use that as a way to help their employees deal better with culture change and then change in general. So Joshua had a good insight. Uh, he said, from my experience, when execs pause and reflect through interviews or whatever, leadership development is a priority. When push comes to shove, however, it gets deprioritized for the day-to-day -day needs. It's viewed as necessary in the long term, but not in the short term. I think that's a really good insight, and that's also what we find with the learners. Um, so if you can figure out how to connect it to something that they're working on right there versus something that they might find useful in the future, it's the same kind of thing. So, that's, so I like that insight. Yeah, a lot of people are agreeing with that. Okay, it looks like we've got time for just a couple more. Um, what percent of their time do executives spend thinking about leadership development? <laughs> do we know that? Uh, <laughs> no, no. Or not as much as us. Yeah, no, no again, that's a, that's a question I wish we knew the answer to. Um, <laughs> well, you know, again, survey after survey, it's, it's their top challenge. It's right. something they know it's important. Uh, we also keep hearing that executives aren't happy with their current state um, or the current results they're getting from leadership development. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a tough nut to crack. But um, they obviously think it's important. They're obviously spending on it. Um, so I, I would say it's it's definitely a top challenge. But um, and as uh, Amy's asking, uh, are we thinking about doing dif what are we thinking about doing differently? based on the findings? Oh, that is a really good question, Amy, and we're thinking about doing a lot of things lot. differently. Yeah. Um, so one of the things is that we're looking at creating the lear these learner journeys, leadership journeys by these particular leader levels and being able to offer content in different um, delivery methods. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're approaching our change to, uh, we're, appro we're changing our approach. Let me try that again. We're changing our approach to our portfolio based on these findings. Yeah, so that whole um, having all types of content available in all different uh, methods, you know, or, or uh, options for learners is something we're looking at as well. Right, and just uh, personalizing that learning journey wherever we can. How can we? Right. How can we add more personalization, customization um, to the learning journey? Are, are probably two of the biggest um, ways we're going to use these findings. Well, thank you all so much. We have uh, reached the end of our time, but thank you, Susan, Mike, and Paula, for sharing what's working well in leadership development today and what buyers and learners want in the future. Um, tomorrow, everyone uh, will receive a follow-up email with a link to the webinar recording, as well as the new research report, Benchmarking the State of Leadership Development Today and Tomorrow, with data to help you benchmark your spending and design your strategy. We hope our attendees have enjoyed the session today and will join us again for our future webinar. As you exit the webinar, we hope you'll take a moment to complete the evaluation so that we can continue to make these events well worth your time. You can also request that a CCL team member follow up with you. Again, thank you all for joining us. All right. Thank you, everyone. This actually concludes today's webcast. Thank you all for attending. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with a link to the recording. And please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.